Welcome everybody to by now the 30th installment of the PyData Cambridge meetup. Um, we've gone fully online for about a year, a little bit more than a year now, and we're happy to share two exciting speakers with you um, tonight. Before we get to that, a few matters of housekeeping and general interest. So here's our agenda for tonight. So we'll have a couple of minutes, just uh, introduction. And then our first speaker for the evening is going to be George Dinej, who's going to talk to us about using perceptual data to move forward, uh, to move towards the future of virtual reality. And then we'll have a short break, about five minutes to allow for questions and a follow discussion. And then our second talk of the evening is going to be Mamadou Diallo, who's going to talk to us about analyzing complex survey data using Python. Both talks are about half an hour in length, so we expect to be finished around 20 minutes past eight. And just as a matter of general interest, we, we do record the meetup and we make the recordings available afterwards so that you can catch up or share um, A little bit about who we are and um, what we do. So for the regulars, this is probably already quite familiar, but we are the local meetup chapter of uh, the PyData organization. We're nominally hosted in Cambridge, although these days with, uh, and that's Cambridge in the UK, um, but having moved online for the duration of the, the pandemic, um, that boundary has blurred a little bit. And we were inaugurated in November of 2018. We've organized so far a monthly meetup every last Wednesday of the month. And apart from myself, um, there's Federico, Leandro and Ola, who are um, the four of us are, are co-organizing the, the meetup. So we're all volunteers and we're sponsored by NumFocus to, to make the, the meetup happen. Um, and I have a little bit about NumFocus in the next slide. So NumFocus is an organization to um, promote open code and uh, for the, the purpose of uh, promoting better science. And the PyData set of meetups is and conferences is a part of uh, the NumFocus organization. So NumFocus does more than just organizing meetups and, and conferences. They also sponsor a bunch of open source packages and if you've done anything with Python or R or Julia or Stan, um, chances are that you've used one of the NumFocus sponsored packages. Um, if you like what NumFocus is doing, you can contribute to their mission either by helping out or by considering donating um, if you, you want. We have a code of conduct for the meetup. Um, the code of conduct basically boils down to treat other people the way that you want to be treated. Um, so even though this is an online event, it's still a community event and we ask you to be kind to others um, and not um, insult or put um, other people down or cause um, offense or um, um, through hurtful behavior, make other people feel unwelcome. So I think that's fairly reasonable. Um, nonetheless, if you feel that there has been a violation of the code of conduct or that there's something that you're not comfortable with, how it um, transpired in the meetup, you can reach out to, to us as the organizers of the, the meetup. Um, we are also partly responsible for the um, enforcing the code of conduct or to um, Leonie Mook as a, an outsider, um, outside of the, um, organization of, of the meetup. And then before we get started, we want to give a shout out to our sponsors that made the meetup possible. Um, so they've been doing that both when we had the in-person meetup, when they sponsored pizza and beer and drinks, and also online and help us pay for Zoom licenses and other fees. Um, our sponsors have um, some news to share with you, some job postings. If you do end up applying for a job or you reach out because of something that you heard in this meetup, um, do mention that uh, PyData Cambridge um, sent you. 
it's always good to spread the word and to make sure that um, to, to convince them that their sponsorship money is basically well spent and effective. So from the side of ARM, there are a couple of um, career positions that they've posted out to us. Um, principal data engineer, graduate data engineer, um, data analyst, and senior performance analyst engineer. There's a link at the bottom of the page to the ARM um, company careers website where you can find more information or you can contact Federico or Leandro who are part of the um, organizers of the meetup. Raspberry Pi um, is also one of our sponsors. They've gracefully hosted us when back in the days when it was still a, an in-person meetup. They have a fantastic venue full of um, interesting things to, to discover. Um, now that everybody's gone fully online, they have weekly live streams with educational activities involving Raspberry Pi. And we encourage you to check that out at rpf.io slash home, where you can find more information. Fetch.ai is sharing a little bit of news about projects that they've um, recently completed or, or engaged with. They have um, autonomous economic, economic agent manager um, that's just come out in a public beta. Um, it lets you run finished agents without having to code and um, it's supported on many different platforms and sort of lowers the barrier to entry. If you want to find out more, there's a link at the bottom of the page where you can find both more information about the um, autonomous economic agent manager and about the um, architecture for the agent framework that they've developed. They've also asked us to announce that they, they are part of a um, automotive network, the Catena X automotive network. And you can find a little bit more information on LinkedIn, um, which is a partnership with different um, automobile vendors. And they have also different channels for you to reach out either via Discord or by checking out the code um, that they've made available on GitHub. In terms of jobs, they have a number of job postings. If you want to know more, um, there's a link in the middle of the page, fetch.ai slash jobs, and an email address that you can use to reach fetch.ai. And last but not least um, about us, we, we are always looking out for speakers. Um, if you have an idea for a talk that you want to share with us and that you want to develop in a talk, we'd love to hear about it. Um, do reach out even if you're not certain whether the topic is appropriate or not. We're always happy to um, give advice and, and guidance. We're also looking for sponsors if you're um, from a corporate entity and you want to send some goodwill our way. As I mentioned before, the sponsorship fee helps us with the upkeep of the meetup. Um, the, the, the fees that go into Zoom and, and other um, online activities. Um, so do reach out for that. We are recording the meetup and we will make the recording available shortly after um, today's meetup is finished. It will be made available through the PyData YouTube channel and you can find a link to that um, on the page as well. And then last but not least, if you want to give us a shout out because you enjoyed the, the meetup, you can tweet at us at PyDataCambridge or send us an email at PyDataCambridge at gmail.com. So then just before I hand it over to our first speaker of the evening, um, I want to uh, emphasize something that Ola posted in the chat. If you have any questions during the uh, either of the talks, feel free to post things in the, the chat or in the QA function. Um, we, we will have some time after each talk to, to address questions. Um, and do feel free to, to reach out and introduce yourself. Um, and we'll get started with that. So I will stop sharing my screen. And then our first speaker for the evening is George. OK. 
Okay. Yep. Can you see my screen? Good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just as a quick introduction. So um, George is going to talk to us today about using perceptual data to move towards the future of virtual reality. And George has received his PhD, MA and BA from the Computer Lab Laboratory here in Cambridge. And his research interests include computer graphics, specifically high frequency displays and virtual reality. And previously he's worked as a software engineer at Microsoft, as a VP of engineering at Meet Elise, and as a research intern and consultant at Facebook Reality Labs. And he has a growing interest in educational research and great predictions, as he has recently started teaching at the Burr School, also here um, in Cambridge. So we're glad to have you with us tonight, George. Um, thank you for coming and uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. And I suppose you can see the presentation as well. Yeah. It's Perfect. Lovely. Clear. All right. Uh, well, uh, due to and after the introduction, I probably have fewer things to say than I thought. But indeed, as as you were saying, so the, the name is George Danish. It's a somewhat funky spelling, fairly easy pronunciation. And today I'm going to be talking about various bits and pieces of my PhD. Uh, specifically, I will be discussing the need and the use of perceptual data and how it can be applied in computer graphics. I should hopefully explain how it can help us move forward towards the future of virtual reality, just kind of inspiring the title. If you haven't come across these topics before, then don't worry, I will give a quick and gentle introduction in a second. Now, this slide is probably rendered rather redundant now, but super quickly, I'll just go through this. So, and um, yes, I did most of my research here in Cambridge. The one I do want to highlight is that many of this was done in collaboration with Alexei Mikhailik, who kindly gave a presentation on PyData Cambridge in January, I believe. So while he was focusing more on the theoretical framework, I'm going to spare you most of the details of, of the maths here. And I'm going to be focusing on motivation challenges and applications. But if you're interested by perceptual research, then do check out his presentation as well. Uh, for full context, yes, uh, so I've worked in a couple of positions. This talk is not endorsed by anyone at the moment, as I am uh, right now just teaching at the purse. But I did have uh, some fun working both at the university and at Facebook. And the talk that I'm doing today is going to be present inspired by those two. Right, but first of all, then, let's talk about the VR. And let's talk about what exactly virtual reality is. And while the history of this technology goes back at least as far as the 1960s or something, if not further, to be honest, it has only gained popularity in the recent years with the release of the consumer headsets like the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. Fundamentally, if you haven't come across it, you can think of it like a simulated experience that you can enter by putting on a headset. Then the headset will display two different frames for your two eyes. And the aim is to make you believe that, that the stimulus or the imaginary around you is so re realistic, it's so high quality that you sort of believe that it really is the world around you. A few related technologies that you might have heard of are AR and XR. Now, AR stands for augmented reality, which is a modern version of the Google Glass, if you have come across that one. It basically merges real and virtual objects into the same scene. And then XR is used normally as an umbrella term for all of these technologies. I'm not going to be highlighting all of these later on. So when I say VR, you can sort of think about all of those at the same time. Now, what you see on the right here is considered to, to be well, by many at least, to be the first headset ever invented. It seems a bit clunky probably by modern standards. And the only thing I do want to highlight on that is how it has already one key property. It's probably one of the first devices in the history that relies on the perceptual understanding that two separate displays can create a sense of depth. Now, it might seem trivial, but in the rest of the talk, you will see how further insights into perception have shaped the path of virtual reality. Now let's look at what it would take to make VR indeed fully realistic, which is sort of the holy grail of graphics nowadays. The question can be rephrased as how much data would the image frames take that perfectly represent reality? And probably the classical engineering answer, and I will try to not offend any engineers on the call, is to create a device and increase it every possible, create a device and then increase every possible aspect of it, hoping that the user will be satisfied. For a somewhat perhaps better estimate, you'll need to somehow rely on the knowledge of the human visual system to understand what exactly a VR headset needs to be able to do. Now, of course, visual system is quite complex, so this is going to be just a very rough approximation. But first of all, I just say that obviously 
we have a limited field of view. So roughly the human eye can see 150 degrees horizontally and vertically. So it's going to be 150 by 150. Then within each square degree, the eye has a finite number of photoreceptors. So it can only see limited detail in plain English. Tiny areas are integrated by our, by our eyes. So there's no need to draw more than the smallest resolvable line. And if you're interested in all of the dry bear there, then Wendell's book on the foundation of vision will be your go-to guide. Now we also have a limited ab ability to differentiate between colors. And while there's no clear consensus here, normally people say about four, by five, uh, four or five bytes per pixel probably provides enough storage, as long as you're using some kind of reasonable compression there. And you can see on the left, if you don't have enough colors, then you basically see these weird bending artifacts. Now, when it comes to moving objects, then an insufficient number of frames can cause blurry or juddery motion. And I'm going to be brave enough and I'll try to do this over Zoom, which may or may not work. Now, what I'm hoping is that if you see the moving eye tracker, then it should hopefully look fairly juddery or fairly blurry if you try to follow it. Now, this is actually one of the many insights that Oculus Rift and HTC Vive made very good use of, realizing that you need at least 90 frames per second which is a bare minimum to avoid VR sickness. And at last, well, we have two eyes, which if your mental math is keeping up, then you should get somewhere around 230 gigabytes per second. And of course you want to keep it in a very slim hardware. Now in contrast, what is the reality of virtual reality? If you excuse me the pun. Uh, well, image on an HTC Vive Pro look rather pixelated. The only parameter that they do hit is actually the 90 frames per second. And the reason is because fewer than that could actually cause users to throw up. And if you run the maths, then you get roughly about one gigabyte per second. Now, that's in contrast to the 230 gigabytes per second. So even if you bet on the incredibly swift development of GPUs, we simply cannot reach the required processing power within the next 16, 17 years. And even then, the form factor remains a huge issue. Because let's be honest, nobody wants to walk around with a couple of RTX cards just glued onto their head. Now, don't get me wrong, VR headsets are engineering marvels. But since human perception is, it has final limits, basically, and it makes sense to guide our research by perceptual models. We know, for example, that the actual perceptual and bandwidth of the visual system is much smaller. So then it becomes a matter of figuring out where we can remove data without the observer noticing. And what you see on screen is, is showing it's, it's not a new, a new idea by any means. The fact that RGB subpixels can fool your brain to hallucinate a continuous range of wavelengths, and this is a phenomenon called metamerism, is a classical example of perceptual insights in graphics and also in display technologies. It's so ubiquitous, though, that you probably don't even think about it consciously being a perceptual phenomenon. Now, let's talk about a few more recent examples. Uh, there's one. Uh, called TRM or temporal resolution multiplexing, or I like to refer to it as the first half of my PhD. Here, the idea is that the visual system is fairly oblivious to flickering as long as it happens in the fine details of the image. So we do our we do object to large flicker, but we don't really care about small things when moving around or changing very rapidly. So the idea we had to know there was to draw every other frame in the low resolution, and if you flip between those two very quickly, you can probably get away with down and with around forty percent saving without actually sacrificing quality, that is. The question is though, how much do we reduce the resolution? And also, does it even work? It is also known that the eye cannot follow moving objects perfectly, like the eye checker I asked you to follow there. Um, this allows for a range of adaptive algorithms that favor, for example, high resolution, so high spatial resolution law of pixels when the image is stationary. But it will reduce the resolution, it will move fast, it will have a lower lag, when the object that you're tracking is moving fast. Now, the question of course here is, what do we, con what do, we do when the movement is slow? What constitutes as fast move motion? Is there a threshold? And so where is it? I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but if you're interested, then do then please feel free to check out those two papers. The technique I will talk more about is probably the most popular perceptual rendering topic nowadays. It's called foveated rendering, or gaze contingent rendering, as some call it. Here, the idea is that the eye actually has a non-uniform resolution. 
whilst you can see very fine detail in color around your fixation points, wherever you're looking, our periphery is blurry and mostly monochromatic. A classical demonstration is, well, something that everyone can do at home, if you fancy you can give it a go, is if you extend your arm and you look at your thumbnail. Now it turns out the only thing right now you would see properly is your thumbnail and the rest of the world is just blurry and faded around you with almost no color. The interesting bit is that your brain will try to fill in all that information so you won't be consciously aware of this. A rendering technique that could exploit that though is one that wouldn't even bother generating most of the information in the periphery. Question is though, what do we mean by not rendering most of the information? How much data can we save there? What do we need to keep? What is the eye sensitive to? 10 years ago, Gunther et al. suggested drawing images of multiple resolution and just blending them. And what you see on the right there, that's an illustration of that. We have a more recent example, because obviously 10 years in computer science it feels like a lifetime. This technique is called deep fovea. It uses advances in deep learning to reconstruct frames from an irregular sampling grid. So you basically start off with some very sparse samples and then you try to reconstruct a full bitmap image from that. With your experience now, if you're interested in the topic, you can probably propose newer and better foveated rendering methods. There are many of them out there. But how do you tune those magical numbers, those magic parameters? How many samples do you need? And how do you know whether your technique even works? Now, ultimately, to calibrate these algorithms and to validate them, we again have to come back to human perception. We basically have two questions. If the algorithm targets, or two options rather, if the algorithm targets a widely understood region of perception, such as color, for instance, or static images, then you might be able to use some existing models and you might get off the whole topic fairly quickly. Example might be the visual difference predictor or color spaces that give you a fairly good abstraction of how to manipulate your information. Now, alternatively, and that is the case for foveated rendering, I'm afraid, we have to start doing our own psychophysical research because there's just not enough information and there are not enough models out there. So the premise of psychophysical validation is that the ultimate consumer is going to be a human. Therefore, a human or a group of them are the most competent judges of subjective quality. If you're interested in how different experimental protocols and then we work out and how the math behind them works out and do take a look at Alex's presentation from earlier this year. Here, I will rely on his ever so wise conclusion that data collection is expensive. And he also mentions that mechanical Turk might give you a good compromise where you can maybe just gather a bit more data even if it's a bit more noisy. But unfortunately, it doesn't really work with VR and we shall see in a second why that is. But just to give a, a simpler example first of a more classical, traditional psychophysical experiment, uh, this is a frame rate experiment condensed into a single slide. The idea was what you see there is how we use the side by side pairwise comparison setup. So the observer would be literally looking at two monitors stacked on top of each other. And this helped us figure out how the perceived quality of different refresh rates changed with the speed of motion that you see on screen. Now, fundamentally, you can use uh, such data to guide for some of the adaptive re rendering methods that I mentioned earlier, or it might just help you figure out whether that 165 Hertz monitor that you really want to buy is worth your money. To give you an idea about scale, we had 11 participants with 600 comparisons for each of those participants. And this counts as a huge large scale experiment as far as psychophysics is concerned. We also needed to conduct it in a lab as obviously most of the Amazon Talk users wouldn't necessarily have 265 Hertz GC monitors at home. Now, VR poses even more experimental challenges. Side-by-side -side comparisons are not really possible because it doesn't make sense to try to do it on the two eyes separately because human perception wouldn't allow you to actually make good judgments there. So you do need to present the stimuli or the things you want to compare in this case, one after another. This is also called a two interval force choice design. It can take longer and it's less reliable than the classical side by side two alternative force choice. Out of lab experiment is also out of the question as you need a headset, you probably need an eye tracker. 
And you also have to be careful not to expose ob observers to VR for too long for health and safety reasons. Just to make it more fun, the data you want to measure has a ridiculously high dimensionality, which doesn't really fit with the restriction compar restricted comparison budget. Some of the dimensionalities would include luminance, which is a physical quantity for how bright your image is. It would include contrast, spatial frequencies, temporal frequencies, colors, velocity of the object you're trying to, um, uh, to follow, eccentricity, which is the distance from the retina, how far, or distance from the fixation point, how far is it in your periphery. And of course, you do have a law of rendering algorithms you could consider that you might want to compare. Which leads us to the problem we wanted to address with our joint project at Facebook and Cambridge, which I'm happy to say will be published now at SIGGRAPH 2021 this summer. So the aim here was to capture a data set that is simple enough to fit within the budget of a psychophysical experiment with all its limitations, but it still represents visual artifacts that are typical of foveated renderers. In the paper, we also present a perceptual model, which predicts this and other data sets actually surprisingly well. I will focus on the experiment today, though. We've budgeted this experiment to contain roughly 8,000 comparisons, which again is pretty large scale for a psychophysical experiment. It ended up being roughly 35 observers with approximately 230 comparisons each. And even that had to be collected over multiple sessions. So we had to invite people to come back on different days. The stimulus design was quite an exciting challenge. And I hope that some of the animations at least show through the Zoom call. We wanted the, the stimulus to be representative of VR context, content, which had to be a bit more complex than typical perceptual science stimuli, which usually are just Galbor wavelets flickering some, somewhere in your periphery. But we also wanted to avoid using photographic and video content, as these tend to contain hard to parameterize uh, stimuli in them. Primarily, we knew that velocity, and um, velocity in this case of the on-screen motion that we might want to follow, is actually quite important, and especially that is so in the periphery. But several other experiments that would be using 360 videos, which is quite an easy choice in that case, they don't contain sufficient or representative motion. So it might be, for example, a fully stationary frame with maybe some movement in a tree somewhere nearby. But it's hard to capture, it's hard to understand, it's hard, hard to then build a model on. This is how we ended up with the weird floating points that you see on the right. And the different clips there are just different contents with different parameters. Now, the fun bit, a bit about this, I suppose, if there is an actual classical vision scientist in the call, they will be freaked out by how complex it is. And the graphics community will be talking about how this is not representative. So we're hoping we hit the sweet spot somewhere there. If you're interested in VR, it looks more like this. So we are filling the whole field of view and all the dots will be moving around. Right, so we also wanted to make sure that we capture the essence of foveated rendering artifacts. And we wanted to do it without committing to a specific implementation of a foveated renderer, because we might just capture and overfit that single artifact there then. So we parameterized foveated rendering using the sampling rate, which is basically the number of pixels you actually have, those would be the gray pixels versus the entire image in this case. And the other parameter we found was the spatial temporal trade-off, which basically says whether your final content is going to be blurry, like tunnel vision, like on the top row, or is it going to be flickery, like you see on the bottom row. Now, in the animations, you see actually how fewer samples will result in lower quality. Higher number of samples is going to result in higher quality. But the interesting thing here already is that if you look at it carefully, it turns out that Sometimes, if you have moving dots around, it, do, it does mask in some of the flicker. This is a similar animation. It just highlights this trade-off, how different velocities will help you maybe hide certain artifacts or highlight them if the image is stationary. Now, testing all combinations of pairs in five dimensions with a result in a, in a prohibitively large number of comparisons. So we instead decided to use a block design where basically luminance, contrast, and velocity, which are all the content parameters, we kept them constant. And within each block, only the sampling rate or the temporal trade-off was changed. Again, we are still in two dimensions. So we further reduced the number of comparisons by 
presenting only neighboring conditions as shown on the figure. So basically only the red areas would have been measured in this case, but the top one is the reference image. At this point, we could have explored some active sampling approach, which is a cool alternative. But after some initial pilot, I mean, we figured that actually comparisons are quite meaningful and a good comparison will be a tricky one. So if you find a comparison too easy, then it's not yielding you too much information. Right, I just have a quick teaser of the results that you can get when scaling all these pairwise comparisons onto a singular quality scale. To get the scales in this case, you would have to add up all the different comparison results, create your ranking matrices, and then use some models like Thurston 5 model to actually assume some distribution of the qualities. What you see there is though that your vertical axes are going to be your qualities, which will correspond to roughly linear units. Velocity being the three columns. So left column being when the stimulus is stationary, right column when the stimulus is moving around quite quickly. And this beta parameter is when it's low, that means that we have very high tunnel vision feelings versus very flickery images. And the cool bit is you can actually see how this already is highlighting the difference between different velocities. So it was a nice reinforcement of our initial suspicion that velocity matters. One other thing I want to highlight at this stage though, is that we only had very limited data. So modeling these curves using complex machine learning methods is not really feasible. There's a very high chance of overfitting to the specific artifacts of this, model, of this stimulus. Instead, usual practice is to use some state-of-the-art method with free parameters, so statistical or white box perceptual model that uses some of the insights that we know how the visual system works. All right, and just a very quick summary. So it turns out perceptual research helps us guide computer science and graphics research. It gives us some of the very cool insights that we have. It gives you ideas and a couple of models already if you're trying to tap into areas that are already known. Plus it gives you a framework for validation. But data, expensive, um, data collection is quite expensive, so you need to quite often make compromises. And that usually ends up just meaning that you have to have fewer comparisons than it would be ideal. Plus, the unfortunate bit is we don't quite have enough data to make use of ML models, or at least not at this stage. Now, I believe that is the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, then I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you very much, George. That was a wonderful talk. Um, so we have a bit of time for questions. If you have a question for George, feel free to post it in the question and answer box and we'll get to it as soon as we can. Now I might just stop the screen share so I can see the Q&A box as well. So while we give it a few minutes, I maybe have a um, question that, that that's maybe um, informed by my lack of inexperience with the field. But can you say a little bit about um, when you do the experiment, how you uh, present the the materials to the the test subjects? Like, what, what kind of deployment do you have to um, present the different um, designs to, to to your users? Yeah, uh, quite often that's the computer science bit. So in this case, for example, since we are talking about VR, which is bleeding edge technology, you end up writing quite often almost like a small game engine or using a game engine to present your stimuli. So that's, that's quite usually the fun bit there. Uh, you tend to think about your stimuli very carefully. So sometimes if you want to well, get photographic content that you would spend quite a lot of time thinking about what are the existing 3D photographs, 360 photographs, how do you get hold of those? So that's quite of an experimental design. That bit is also quite taxing and that's more of the techn technological challenges. Then the actual presentation in, in, at that point in time, since, since it's all real-time rendering in this case, it would need to happen on a fairly powerful computer hooked up to a VR headset, uh, which we did in the computer lab, or Facebook had a dedicated setup for that in Redmond. Mm. Nice. Fun experiments though, because usually it involves you sitting in the dark as well, because you want to control for background lighting. So you would invite people to sit in a dark room for about an hour and we would try to compensate them with some Amazon batteries or something to keep them happy. That was a good strategy. <laughs> Thank you. In the meantime, we have a question that came in from Alex. Uh, 
I'll read it out loud. Um, you can also follow along. One are these simple scenes a good proxy for real world scenes? And two is color an important dimension for VR? Right. Uh, well, I think the first one is a very interesting question where, as I was saying, we ended up somewhere in the middle because uh, perceptual scientists, they usually prefer very, sim very simple stuff like Gabor wavelets, sinusoids, uh, which are then very hard to interpret and, and to make them meaningful in graphics. And on the other hand, the graphics community is usually complaining about anything that doesn't contain colorful pictures, that there wouldn't be an actual VR content, as in it wouldn't be, for example, a 3D video, or it wouldn't use one of the highest end techniques for rendering, I don't know, shiny bits of gold or whatever you want to think about. Um, so that's actually probably one of the main criticisms that we have received about this experiment. And the reason is because we are somewhere in between two communities there. Now, our, our argument is that the artifacts are representative, hence the content itself doesn't need to be representative. So we believe it actually is a fairly good proxy, but it's very hard to make both communities happy at the same time. And that's for the second question. Color is a very exciting one because usually in these sort of experiments, uh, color is, it always comes up because color is an exciting topic. Having said that, it turns out color perception is not as important as luminance perception. So most artifacts you see are related to the brightness of an object rather than the color of an object. And for that reason, if you start designing experiments and you find yourself with a limited budget, or if you start designing a model and you find yourself with a limited computational budget there, the solution usually is to first remove color. So we've taken, taken the liberty of doing that, which is a fairly common approach, but obviously it does have some impact. So we should incorporate it sometime in the future. There's no question from the audience. I, I'd like to ask a question. Um, hey, um, George, thanks a lot for the talk. It was really very interesting. Um, my question is going to be slightly different from the other ones. I'm, I'm asking this because, um, you know, we have often people here in the audience that are thinking about careers in data and uh, or careers in research. I, I noticed you, you, you sort of like had this very research and technology focused career, and then you decided to go into, into teaching. Do you want to say a little bit about the motivation, your motivation to do that and, and what excited you about that? That's an interesting one. Um, I think the main excitement was that I had the, an opportunity to try out some teaching before. So I had an opportunity to volunteer before in schools. Uh, I was supervising quite a lot in, during my university years. And I figured this is something I really enjoy doing. I'm fairly passionate about, but it is, as you say, a bit tangential to, uh, to all the technological challenges. Uh, obviously there are two aspects there. I'm teaching computer science, so I still get to do all the technology, except in this case, I get to try at least to pass down some of that knowledge. And second of all, it turns out the, the field of an academic research on education is equally interesting. So I'm doing a project now, for example, that's related to the of course great predictions and it turns out many of the things are actually using the same psychophysical measures for scaling student performance, because it turns out it's just human observer data. So it does kind of uh, map quite nicely to other fields as well. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I think we've gone over the open questions um, i think george said that uh, he may stick around for a bit if there's any questions um, if not you can um, reach him at the contact details shared during the talk and with that then we can move on to our speaker second speaker for the evening while he's getting set up I will briefly introduce him. So Mamadou Diallo has more than 15 years of experience in survey sampling and small area estimation and other topics in statistics. And he currently works for UNICEF as the immunization data team lead at the global level. He holds a PhD in statistics from Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, where he conducted research in small area estimation and he has undergrad degrees from Laval University in Canada and Université Claude Bernard in Lyon. And we're happy to have him talk today about samplex, 
a Python package that he um, designed for analyzing complex survey data. Thank you very much for having me. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I hear you loud and clear and everything. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for attending the presentation. So today I'm going to uh, walk you through how you can analyze uh, complex survey data using Python. So this is mainly an introduction to the package I have been developing. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, um, I already introduced my background, but my handle is here at the bottom. Um, if you want to connect with me, please uh, 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 feel free to, to send me a message. So the plan of the presentation today, so we are going to discuss uh, an introduction. Uh, so just we just have the basics, but uh, we are mainly going to focus on a tour of Semplex. So we're gonna discuss how you can do uh, sample size calculation, how you can do uh, sample selection, uh, how you weight your sample uh, population, how you can use the package to estimate population parameters like mean totals, et cetera. And then we will show us a small example of uh, t-test. So uh, why Semplex? So uh, when I start learning uh, Python a uh, couple of years ago, uh, there were no comprehensive package to do survey, uh, to analyze survey data. Uh, and on the other hand, Python has a lot of uh, a rich ecosystem for statistician to do machine learning, data science, and so on. So uh, statistician who work in a space of official statistics uh, and are Python users, they need to uh, have another software like R, or Stata, SPSS, SAS, et cetera, to do survey, to analyze survey data. So the idea of this package is to bridge that gap so that if you're a Python user, you can remain in the Python ecosystem and analyze um, survey data. Uh, a disclaimer here, uh, the package is in a beta version at this point. So the API is still breaking the APIs. So um, if you want to use this for uh, production, you will have to be following the, the development or uh, maybe uh, you can wait a little bit. Uh, hopefully it's gonna be uh, stable uh, soon. Uh, at the bottom here, I put a link where you can find um, um, the documentation. In the documentation, we have a tutorial where you can uh, get yourself familiar with uh, Samplex. So what is survey data? So I'm not gonna go into the detail because it's a vast complex topics, uh, but I think we are all familiar with selecting a, a sample from a final, po final population using known probability of selections. Um, often in complex and large surveys, additional features are added for, uh, to reduce costs, for example, or for operational reasons, or for a statistical efficiency to make the estimate, estimate make the estimates more precise. So here I list a couple of examples. For, for example, you have stratification, which consists of grouping your unit, yeah, putting the unit that are similar in, uh, in the same groups, and then selecting independently from each group. You have clustering, which uh, we, we group uh, units, sampling unit by small uh, clusters, and then you select clusters. And within each cluster, you either um, uh, select all the sampling unit in a given cluster, or you can do further uh, selection in those clusters. You have phase sampling, calibration, etc. So there are many features that you can uh, enhance your your sampling strategy was, and the idea is now you, when you do your estimation, you need to take into account those features so that your estimation are representative of the population you wanna, uh, <clears throat> you wanna uh, discuss. So here I show um, two questions that we're gonna use to illustrate uh, the Samplex package. So the first question is, what is the household poverty rate in the US? 
And the second is, uh, is there a difference between a household headed by a woman versus household headed by one in men in terms of uh, poverty rate? So to answer this question, I use the ACS 2019. So this is the American Community Survey uh, that I obtained from IPAMS. So here I, I'm just using a subset of the, sam uh, the sample. Uh, the idea is not to do a rigorous analysis of the, the sample. So the numbers I'm gonna show here are not representative of the, uh, of the survey. I just wanted some real life data to illustrate uh, the sampling APIs. So here to give you a visual uh, uh, understanding of the data. So I put here the, the data frame, uh, selected uh, 15 random households. So each line here is a household. You can see the household ID here. You have the region. Uh, I have four regions here, Midwest, South, North, East, uh, uh, and the West. You have the PSU. Again, a PSU is a cluster of households. So put, I put households randomly together and form clusters. You have three variables here that are related to the head of the household, uh, sex, race, and education. You have the income of the family and a poverty. Poverty is a derived variable from income. Uh, which depend on the income and the number of people in the, in the uh, household. So if you below a certain threshold, your, the, the flag is one, and then the zero are for the household that are above the, the poverty uh, or the income threshold. So here I show the first um, example of how you can use Samplex to calculate sample size. So you can see from the module uh, sampling, you, I import the class sample size. And here to calculate sample size, you need the poverty rate. Uh, I have it by region because I want a stratified design. Uh, <clears throat> so in the class here, you need to provide the, uh, the parameter, the type of parameter. So here it, you want to do a proportion. So you want the proportion of household that are below the poverty uh, uh, line. Uh, the method and then the stratification is true because we are doing again a stratified design. And the main method to calculate the sample size from the class is calculate, which is going to give you a sample size uh, based on the target that we expect and the precision that we want. And the precision here is given in terms of a half uh, confidence interval. Here is just a number, but if you want a different uh, number by uh, strata, stratum, then you just provide a dictionary with the, the right specification. Here you, the result is a, a dictionary where you see the sample size by region. If you want to get a data frame, then on the right here, you can call the method to data frame and then it's gonna give you a, a standard data frame. Here, what we calculated is the number of household. If you got, wanna get the number of PSUs, then what I did here is just a simple uh, arithmetic, but uh, I'm gonna select 15 household by PSUs. So I divided the sample size by 15 with, and rounded up, which give me the number of PSUs by region that I'm gonna be selecting from my frame. So now that I calculated the sample size, the next step is to do the sample selection. So here I give the methodology that I provided by Samplex for doing sample selection. You have sample random selection and systematic selection. These two provide equal uh, uh, probability selection. The last one provide an equal probability of selection. And this is the probability proportion to size. So here the selection is, is done based on some measure of size. And these five methodologies here are what, are what is currently implemented. So as we said earlier, we have two stage design. At the first, we select PSUs and at the second, we have the household. So the selection gonna do, gonna go the same way. And in the middle, often between stage one and stage two, we need to do some data collection 
to create a frame for the selection at the second stage. It's not always uh, um, re required. If you have the frame, you can do it, but often in reality, you don't have the frame. And then you go to the field, you do a listing in the PSU that you have selected, and then you use that as your frame. So for selection here, uh, <clears throat> what you need to do to use the uh, samplex you uh, download from the module sampling you download sample selection. And then here the method we're gonna use is PPS systematic. We have a design that is stratified and we don't, we wanna do without replacement. So replacement equal force means that we don't wanna put back the unit selected in the bucket before doing the next selection. So every unit can be selected at most one time. <clears throat> The class, the main uh, method for uh, selection is called select. And then you have to provide the sample units. Here the, the, it's the PSU. The sizes that we wanna select that we showed in the previous slide. Um, the stratification here is by region. And because it's PPS proportional to size, we need the size measure. Here is the number of household within uh, PSU. And then if you obtain the frame, so the output of this is a tuple of three uh, arrays, and I store them directly in the PSU frame. Uh, so here I have these last at the right, the last three columns that are uh, the outcome of these uh, methods. So the first one is a flag to indicate which line was selected, so which household was selected. So the last line was selected. The, the PSU hit, indicates how many times it was uh, selected. And because we are doing without replacement, the most is one. And then you have the probability of selection associated to this. Uh, <clears throat> so now that we have selected the PSUs, we wanna go to the second stage, select the uh, household. And to do that, we, we have a listing also in the 32 selected PSUs, we have a total of 19,000 plus households. So on average, if you look at the distribution here, you can see on average there are about five to 600 household by PSU. Each of the three, uh, 32 PSUs have on average, together on average, uh, five to 600 household. And from each, we're gonna select 15 households using sample random selection. So to run that, uh, we use the sample selection uh, class, but this time the method is sample random selection. And when we call the method select, we give it the household ID. Here, the sample size is just 15. It's not a dictionary like uh, previously because we are selecting 15 in all the, stra uh, the strata. So we just can just give 15 and uh, that will work. Um, the stratification here follow the PSU because we want to, for each PSU, select 15 uh, households. The flag to data frame equal true provide you with a data frame and then sample uh, only equal true uh, subset the, the data to only uh, retain the, the sample, the, the selected units. So the non-selected are excluded from the output. So now that we have our sample selected, we need to calculate the weights. Uh, <clears throat> and to calculate the weights, we're gonna, the design weight or the base weight, which are the initial weights, they're gonna be just the inverse of the probability of inclusion or the inverse of the probability of selection. And uh, to get the probability of selection is just the product of the probabilities of selection for the different stages. We have two, so we do the product here to get the probability and we inverse it to, to get the design. So this is sampling theory. It's not necessarily uh, anything to do with, with samplex, just calculation. But what samplex is gonna bring to you is all the adjustments you need to do to the weights so that at the end, your final weight represents, still represent the uh, targeted population. So here I list a couple of the, I list the uh, adjustment method 
uh, methods that are implemented. So you can do non-response adjustment, meaning moving some of the, the weight from the non-respondent to the respondent. Uh, calibration, when you have auxiliary variable with non uh, totals or aggregated value, uh, you can use them to, to adjust your weight. Normalization is just a technique to scale your weight to add up to some uh, known uh, some known value. Uh, replicate weights, there are three methods that are implemented, BR, bootstrap, and jackknife. This will allow you to uh, calculate more complex uh, statistics. So to do non-response weighting, you need to know the uh, response status of your variables. And uh, Samplex has a standard way of knowing the status. So you have the ineligible RIN, RR for respondent and non-respondent and so on. So this is the nomenclature understood by Samplex. So if your data follow a different nomenclature, you need to give to Samplex a mapping dictionary so that it can map and understand your uh, uh, classification. So here you can see the variable here, the response status. It's a, a spelled out respondent, non-respondent and so on. So I provide here the mapping so that uh, uh, Samplex understand what is non-respondent and so on. To, to adjust the weight for non-response, I import the sample weights uh, class and then I use the method adjust, which is the main one for doing non-response adjustment. So you provide the, the original weight, you provide the classes where you want to do the adjustment. So it's gonna adjust the weight within region and race, and then the house, the, the response status. So respondent, non-respondent, et cetera. And then the mapping, if it's different from the standard one that uh, some, some things understand. So you can see the result here. So design weight is the original weight and this was adjusted uh, to get the non-response weight. And you can see a non-respondent now have a weight of zero and this weight was redistributed to the other unit. And that was done by the class which is based on uh, uh, region and race. Oops. So this example here is an example of calibration. So you can calibrate your weight to, to, uh, to some or to, to some known total or rate or some aggregates. So here the example I show is by a region, we know the number of household below the poverty rate of the poverty uh, line, and we know the number of children. So we're gonna use uh, the calibrate method from the class to calibrate the non-response weight in, using the auxiliary information that we have above and using the non-statistics uh, or controls at the population level. And we wanna do this by, uh, by region. So just to show you here uh, a test to, for you to better understand what it's doing, after the calibration, the weights are gonna provide the same control totals uh, than the one that we knew prior to our adjustment. So the weights have been adjusted so that poverty give the same no numbers as before and number of children the same. So that can help in certain cases in some estimation methods. So for the estimation, we have mainly two broad classes. We have the uh, Tyler-based estimates and the replicate-based estimates. So for the Tyler-based estimate, you can do proportion, mean, total ratios, uh, and quantiles are not yet implemented, but are, are under development. So to do an estimate here, what we need, what we want to estimate is the poverty rate, which is a proportion. So I, I, I bring the, the, the appropriate class here for the Tyler estimate. And then I call the method estimates from the class. So that's 
going to require me to provide the output variable that I'm interested in, the weight. So we're going to use the final calibrated weights and uh, uh, the, uh, the stratification and the PSUs. So running that, I get this output here where you can see that the proportions of households uh, under the poverty line uh, uh, is about 12%. And then you have the associated stat statistics like the standard error, the confidence interval, et cetera. So the point of providing the design uh, information is to get these statistics correct. Otherwise the information you will get will not take into account the complexity of the design and will not be uh, correct uh, statistics. For the, um, at the beginning, I said one of the question is to know whether the uh, household headed by women are similar or the same to the household headed by men in with regard to the uh, poverty rate. So to do that, I import here from the categorical module uh, t-test class. And here I say that my sample type is one sample because what I want to do here is I have one sample, but I want to compare two groups from the sample. And the compare methods uh, can allow me to specify the variable of interest, which is the poverty status, and then the groups I want to compare, which is sex, male versus female uh, household, and then the design uh, futures, sample weights, uh, stratification, and so on. So it's calculate that information, give me confidence interval, and then here the null hypothesis test is to compare uh, the mean or proportion, which is the same in this case, because it's zero one variable uh, between female and male. And it, it calculates two main class of statistics. The equal variable, uh, the equal variance assumption, and the one that assumed that unequal variance. So you will know your data to know which one is more appropriate for you. But here the statistics are provided for the three alternate, uh, alternative hypothesis, where there is below, uh, above, or uh, uh, two-side test. So you can see here the tests are not uh, significant. Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, will conclude the presentation. So at this point, um, I'm working on example on training and training material. As I mentioned earlier in the documentation, you have tutorial that will help you follow the API. And also I'm working on some of these features um, to, to complete uh, the package. Um, so I stop there for today. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Over. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. So we have a, again a couple of minutes for questions. Um, if anybody has a question, feel free to post it in the question and answer box. And maybe while we wait, I have a question of my own. Um, so you showed some of the methodologies that the package already provides out of the box. Um, I don't know a lot about statistics, but I know it's a huge field. And I'm wondering a bit if you have users that have methodologies that are not comprised in your package. Um, how do you recommend, um, or is there a way for them to extend your package with, for instance, let's say new sampling methods or different estimators? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. There are many methods that currently are not in the package and I, I'm trying to use and will uh, add and I will be very happy to, to get uh, help to, to add, add them faster. So, for example, one big idea that I haven't touched yet uh, is the area of regression. So we, you can use uh, stat, mod, stat models and scikit-learn and et cetera to do regression and then you can add weights, but there are many things in the, in the sampling futures that are not in those ones. So stratification, uh, clustering and a lot of things. So that's a huge uh, module that's going to be adding. So if people are interesting, interested, that one thinks that's going to gonna be very useful. Cool. Thank you. Um, and then maybe just one quick question. 
question because you, you, you hinted at it. Um, so you showed uh, statistical tests at the end. Do you use stats models for that under the hood or do you have a different package for the statistical calculations? Yeah, so, so what I do is I implement the algorithm mostly the same, mostly uh, by hand, but they are when it's required to do, um, to fit a model, I use status, uh, stats models because it's from, you it can, in using weight and, uh, and um, the basic, uh, the basic uh, design sampling design, you can get initial estimate that then you can further uh, tweak the algorithm to get to get it more to what you want. But yeah, basically I try to implement the algorithm as as much as possible from scratch using man, mainly NumPy. Um, but then when it's get to the sophisticated modeling, then I use some of these existing packages too. Yeah. Oh, cool. So in the meantime, we'll have a look. Don't see any further questions. Um, hi, uh, I can go with one if you if you don't have any others. So yep, uh, thanks for the presentation. I noticed you got some uh, graphics on your slides. Yeah. So how do you, uh, is Samplex integrated with any of the kind of famous graphic drawing libraries? Yeah, yeah. so graphics is one of those, uh, those package that uh, I was mentioning earlier that I plan to add, but I have not added yet. So any support will be nice. So the graphics I showed, I use uh, Seaborn, but I use it after the fact uh, using the result of the, the package, but uh, I plan to add some status, uh, some uh, graphics, uh, a graphic module to kind of uh, help visualize some of the result and how the weights are influencing the estimates and so on. So yeah, that's that's in my in the roadmap, uh, but not implemented yet. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Okay, if there are no further questions, then I think we can call it today. So thank you again to both of our speakers for presenting and thank you for um, everybody else for attending. Um, we'll see each other again, hopefully in one month from now for the 31st installment of the meetup. And until then, thank you again for attending and um, have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you for having me.